Paris, thank you. Children's emergency rooms across the city are seeing an increase in patients, but it's not due to COVID. Doctors say it's an early surge in RSV, a common virus that usually appears in the winter that's in part driving this increase. Lurie Children's Hospital says it's seen a 78% increase in patients compared to last August. Joining us to talk about this increase and more is Dr. Thomas Shanley, the president and CEO of Lurie Children's Hospital. Dr. Shanley, thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you, Brandis. Appreciate it. So of the kids that come in, are you seen, seeing mainly intense cases of RSV or some other illness, or is it parents who are afraid because they think it might be COVID? Well, it really is a combination of both of those. Um, this time of year, um, we typically do not see the viruses like RSV, as you mentioned. Uh, with those progressing throughout our community, we're starting to see infants that do have uh, the typical presentation uh, with RSV, which does affect infants much more than it affects older children uh, and adolescents. And it, it, it inflames the lining of their lung, uh, which we call the bronchioles, which is why the disease is often called bronchiolitis. Uh, and so that is a reasonable um, reason to bring the patients in for acute care. They often have difficulty breathing. Their oxygen levels can be uh, low because of their uh, effect on the lungs, and they would need to be hospitalized for additional support. Uh, but there's a, there's a constellation of symptoms that makes them critically ill in that standpoint. And the majority of the patients that we see, uh, while they may have RSV, are not affected to that degree of severity. And so in part, however, because there is some overlap of the symptoms of COVID, we also do believe that too many pa parents are unnecessarily coming to the emergency department because of that worry that it's COVID and really want a reassuring test for COVID um, in, with a patient that doesn't need to be so ill. So part of the challenge that we're having is just making sure that the emergency rooms are serving the kids that they need to see and that our immediate and urgent care areas and frankly, even our primary care uh, settings uh, can be used or even testing sites for, for that reassurance if families are really more worried about COVID than they are the presentation of their child. It, how can parents, can parents tell the difference between RSV and COVID or is that the kind of thing that um, a professional needs to yeah, No, tell? No, they, they can't and we shouldn't rely on them to do so. And uh, uh, even I have sometimes uh, having a difficulty doing, uh, making that discrimination. But it's more, it's not so much about the virus that's causing uh, the illness that makes a parent worry about their child to bring them to professional medical attention. It's really the whole gamut of the constellation of symptoms that professionals can talk through uh, or can even do virtual visits to, to walk through or if they do need to do it in person can do so. So what we're asking is for parents to really reach out and seek their primary care physicians, their pediatricians, um, and if they're worried and run the constellation of symptoms their professional uh, physician or their nurse knows the right questions to ask about the presentations of the baby, what they're doing, how they're breathing, how they're drinking, what their temperature is, does it respond uh, to Tylenol uh, or uh, ibuprofen. And, it, and it's that history collection by a professional that really more determines whether it's serious enough to refer to the emergency department or might be able to be managed in a different setting, including just keeping at home uh, if they're able to do the types of things that uh, otherwise we would set up uh, for home convalescence. So call it, call your pediatrician or go to walk-in care or urgent immediate care before just showing up uh, at the ER, it sounds like. That's that's the advice we're really providing people, unless, of course, there are, you know, significant concerns, uh, a baby not, you know, breathing very, very fast, not being able to catch their breath, a child who's not able to drink and keep things, keep themselves hydrated and stop urinating, uh, ch children that may be so fatigued that they're, they're not acting themselves anymore. Those are some of the more serious symptoms, obviously, that um, can be triggered by any virus that we would obviously want to see that kid through the emergency department. Right. Um, and those, what, again, yeah. are kind of questions the professional will ask and be able to triage really the right site of care for families. Yeah, I think the technical term that parents use is the scary stuff. Um, scary stuff. <laughs> what impact are these high levels of patients in emergency rooms having on the hospital system? System. Well, I would say that the, the main concern we have, first of all, we don't want to inconvenience families. We know um, in a triage system that the sickest patients are going to be seen first. 
So, you know, a family that shows up at eight o'clock whose child is doing okay, maybe has a low grade fever, uh, whereas other children are coming in, they're waiting, and another child comes in at nine who's sicker, another child at 10 who's sicker. We do, that inconvenience of the families that are waiting uh, can be really frustrating for them. And that, that's one thing that we, we don't wanna have happen. But the other thing is just, it's really that filter process, if you will. If we're having to attend to a number of patients, many who may be not needing emergency care, it's harder to find those, um, those patients that do. And we do on a, on a given day, we're currently admitting somewhere probably between 15 up to 25 patients from the emergency department. And we need to make sure that we have the staff present and attentive and capable of managing those who are the most sick and really need the inpatient care. And so we wanna make sure that we're not diluting that capability too much by having kind of a surge or a flood of patients who really don't need to be in the emergency department. And of course, before we let you go, Dr. Shanley, uh parents everywhere still want to know how soon their kids might have access to that vaccine uh, since Pfizer is saying um, that vaccinated children ages 5 to 11 that they are showing protection against the virus. Yeah, so what that means thus far is that uh, Pfizer has submitted the clinical data from the trial to the FDA and now it is in the FDA's hands. I, I think that um, uh, the FDA has to balance two things. Clearly, they want to make sure that it is safe uh, and they're an objective observer and objective scientist evaluating the data. They're not the drug company that did the trial. So we don't want to mix that conflict of interest. We do want to let the scientists on the FDA panel have their time to be able to discern the data that's now been collected on children. And they also know how much pressure there is for families, especially all of us wanting to keep the kids in school this year to get the vaccine uh, approved for emergency authorization use in that age cohort. So they're also moving as fast as they can. So it's okay. really the balance that they're navigating right now between speed and safety on behalf of the kids. I know okay. some of the professionals that are on that body and I know that they're doing their best uh, to do this as quickly and as safely on behalf of kids. I think it's probably a matter probably of weeks. Yeah, probably a matter of weeks. Yes, Go a on. matter of weeks before we get uh, <laughs> FDA approval. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Thomas Shanley, for joining us. We'll have to keep waiting a little longer. Just a little bit longer. Thank you again for the invitation, Brandis.